Welcome in to episode 73 of Gimme the Hot Sauce. The NBA regular season is winding down. We'll get you set with the Bulls' outlook for the upcoming playoffs. They are back in for the first time since the 2016-17 season. But you know, Stacey King is more than just basketball. He loves music. He loves entertainment. we got a special guest today that Stacey brought in after seeing him at the Bulls game the other night. Chris D. Lofton, one of the stars of Power Book 4 Force. It's on Sunday night on Stars. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. You got a chance to talk to him at the arena, and looking forward to visiting with him. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm a big fan of the Power Universe, mm-hmm. and uh, he's a big, big part of the Force Show. Um, he's a big Bulls fan. He's a Chicago native. Um, he was at the game the other night, and uh, it was it was all awesome. Milwaukee game. He was at the Milwaukee game, and we happened to flash him on the screen. Yeah. And uh, normally we we kind of pan through the crowd during timeouts and stuff, and um, so we we're panning through, and and then it was almost like no one knew that was him and then i'm like whoa that's my power guy right there there's my guy right there stop stop yeah. stop and so we stopped and then we started seeing him and um they were having a good time and it, it was really cool and then I, I contacted him after the game because he hit me on twitter and uh because he wanted to let us know that he was from chicago so um next thing you know we started talking via twitter and then you know the rest is history he's on the show so that's coming up and if you have not seen the show it is set in chicago yes drug wars turf wars different families trying to get control of the drug business in chicago it's a it's an incredibly intense show it's yeah. a lot of fun to watch and chris is going to take us through how we got involved with that and, and we'll talk about a whole lot of things with him coming up First of all, though, let's talk about the Bulls back in the playoffs. And Stacy, this has been kind of a, 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 a bittersweet kind of a period. Everyone's excited about the Bulls being in the playoffs, but unfortunately, because of injuries and circumstance, they're not playing their best basketball right now. Can they turn it around in time for the start of the postseason? Well, they're going to have to, or it's going to be a short series. I mean, they, you know, the playoffs are totally different than the regular season. So with the way they're playing at the end of the season, you do not want to go into the playoffs with not playing your best basketball or it's going to be a short series. So um, I'm hoping they can turn it around Um, at the end of the day. You know, Mark, we talked about this and, and, you know, I tell Bulls fans this all the time, you know, this is, there's probably six or seven guys who've never even been to a playoff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people say, well, you get to the playoff, you lose in the first round. What good is that? Anytime you make the playoffs is a learning experience and it's a great experience. So you got to keep that in mind. And all for all the people, the casual fans, um, you know, who are, you know, kind of jumping off the bandwagon now that the Bulls are struggling a little bit. Um, let me let me remind you, you know, we could be the Lakers right now. You know, it's we, true. We They're could going be home. the Lakers right now. They're going home. Um, you know, this team won 31 games last year. They showed improvement last year, you know, with Billy Donovan. You know, going from the Jim Boylan, um, you know, uh, seasons uh, where they had won 26 games, I think, that the year before Billy Donovan came. So they were plus five or six last year. If uh, Zach Levine doesn't go out, they may be in the play uh, play-in game last year. So they would have gotten an opportunity to at least compete to be in the playoffs. But, you know, he missed, you know, the last part of the season, which hurt them. Uh, you got Vooch in the trade. So that that was a kickstart for this season. Then you turn around, you get DeMar DeRozan, you know, Lonzo Ball, Caruso, uh, Derek Jones Jr., you know, a bunch of guys that completely turns your team around. And you were number one most of the year. You know, I think that's where, you know, fans are a little disappointed because it's like, wait a minute, this is not the same team that was leading, you know, you know, top three team in the NBA, you know, during the beginning of the season. But you got to factor in the injuries, the COVID. And, yeah, every team went through it. Every team experienced it. But you know what? At the end of the day, you know, this team is going to be plus 50, you know, plus 15 games wins from last year, which is a huge jump. And if you know anything about sports, there's levels to this. You know, you don't just go from 31 wins to winning an NBA championship. It doesn't as much as we all would want to. It doesn't happen. Show me a team that that didn't make the playoffs the right. year before and won 30 games or less and then won the championship the next year. I'm pretty sure you won't find one unless there's unless it was something 19, you know, 1930s or 40s, you know, when they weren't even calculating basketball back then. You mentioned Lonzo Ball. We learned uh, earlier this week that he is going to miss the remainder of the season. That bone bruise just never really healed. They said that the meniscus surgery, that repair was done, and that's fine. And every tried, he tried to ramp up his running and his cutting, his lateral movement, yet he had pain in that knee. 
he's had a lot of injuries throughout his career. The hope is he can come back next season and be 100% healthy because he means so much to this team with his defense, his playmaking, his three-point shooting. He helps you at both ends of the court. I tell you what, I mean, you know, when you look back on this, you know, in, the, in early in the season, you know, you heard people saying that, you know, oh, you know, I was ready to take, you know, you, you know, take over the role. And, yeah. You know, Kobe White's a better point guard than Zoe and da da da. You know, and then you start to realize as the games went along how important Zoe is. And he is a very important, I guarantee if you ask AK and Mark and, you know, Billy Donovan and the coaching staff, what is the one guy that's irreplaceable? He would be the first guy on your list because of so the things that he can do. He can do so many things to help your team win that sometimes I think fans uh, take for granted. You know, this guy, you remember, he's a point guard. He was the second leading rebounder on our team. He was a guy, when you pair him with Caruso, I would say it's equivalent to two lockdown corners. You know, having Deion Sanders on one side and, you know, Ronnie Lott on the other side. Two lockdown corners that your receivers could not get anything, okay? So when you had both those guys on the floor, they were a terror. The Bulls were like one of the top teams defensively with those guys, with that with that lineup intact. And when he went out, uh, you could tell the defense wasn't the same. You could tell the on-ball pressure from guards were not the same. This was also a guy that if you ran a pick and roll and a pick and switch between the one and the four or the five – he could hold his own against a Giannis in the post. He could hold his own against a center like Anthony Davis, and you wouldn't have to double team to help him out because he's such a good defensive player that he would attack your dribble if you tried to back him down. Um, you know, he was strong enough to brute you off the block, and those things are are really, really missed. And then also the pace of the game. This is a kid that would get a rebound and Without even dribbling, turn up the floor and pitch the ball ahead to a streaking, you know, DeMar DeRozan or Zach Levine running on the wing or Vooch running down the middle of the floor. The Bulls don't have that player now. You know, they're, they're more of a half-court game, right. a half-court team. Um, I was saying last night against Boston, I would like to see him push the tempo a little bit more. You know, more run the ball up the floor and not allowing defenses to get set, uh, especially good de- defensive teams. The Bulls will play either the Bucks, the Celtics, or the 76ers in that best of seven first round. None of them are a picnic. They lost the season series, got swept by all, th- well, no, they beat Boston once uh, early in the season. But they've struggled with those teams. They've struggled against good teams all season long. From a coaching perspective, you get six days off be- between the end of the regular season and the start of that playoff series. What kind of things can Billy Donovan and his staff do to try to even the deck a little bit because they're going to be going in as big underdogs. Well, well, number one is is to really put Vooch in the post. That's that's number one. If if the Bulls are going to have any kind of legit chance to beat any of those teams in the first round, that has to be a priority. We've got to establish him in the post early and often, pound the ball inside, and make him stay in the post. I mean, it's okay for you to a couple times pick and pop here and there. But a majority of the time, you've got to be in the post where we can get you. Because he is very effective in the post. His numbers are totally different as a post-up player compared to an outside shooter. Okay, I want the post-up Vooch. Because that post-up Vooch can get you 25 and still be able to get you 12 to 15 boards. Okay, he's going to rebound no matter where you play him on offense. But I would rather have the 25 and 10 or 12 Vooch in the post than the you know fifteen right, right. and fifteen votes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you can establish him early, you got a, you got a, a puncher's chance there. Uh, second thing I'd like to see uh, you know change a little bit is the defense. You know you got to make adjustments defensively. And one thing about the playoffs, you know it's not adjustments every game. It's adjustments every time out. You know, every every stoppage of play, there's an adjustment. So that's where these guys are going to see a big difference as far as what teams are doing to stop them, what teams are doing to frustrate them defensively. We starting to see a little bit. Boston ran a zone last night. They're not a zone team, but they practiced a zone last night because they're doing things that they're going to be trying to unveil in the playoffs. And we saw that last night. But um, defensively, I'm not a big switching guy. Like, I've never been a big switching guy. I think if you have the players to switch when Zoe was out there and Caruso on the same team, you could switch those guys. But I think the Bulls have to do something defensively. Either, either you know, blitz the pick and roll a little bit more, uh, force Vooch out of that drop zone because that drop zone um, has killed the Bulls all season long. Vooch drops so far in the paint, it allows the guard to get a – first of all, get a good screen because – Coaches are telling their big guys, you set a good screen on that guard, 
you're going to give us something good. We're either going to get a guard driving and hit a rainmaker, you know, a, a teardrop, or we're going to get you on a dive uh, alley oop play every right. single time. And that's yeah. what I would change that up. I change that drop zone. Um, you can still play it, but not not that that can't be your your you know your predominant defense. You can you can't have that as your product because that didn't work all year, and it's not going to work in the playoffs. And teams, if you come out with something different, now teams have to make an adjustment to that because they're saying, wait a minute, oh, we didn't see the Bulls, you know, envision the Bulls blitzing the pick and roll or hard showing and getting back something different for them to play because right now they're going to look at the Bulls and say they're going to run that drop zone and say we're going to score. They're not going to make those adjustments. So uh, I think they throw a curveball there. And then I look to push the ball with that second group. And I said this last night with Io, with Patrick Williams, Kobe, uh, Kobe. You know that second group has to look to run more. You got to get out in transition. Derrick Jones, you know, they're finally you know unleashing him and letting him play now. Which I I, I don't know why he was out of the rotation in the first place because he played so well for him when he was even with a broken finger. Now he's back out there. So I would like to see that group. You know, push the tempo more defensively, pick up a little bit more full court, start change. You know, ch- you know, changing the the complexion of the game when they come in. Because if you start turning them loose defensively, where they're able to pick up full court, trap a little bit, press a little bit, they're going to get into it offensively. They're going to get steals. They're going to get transition. They're going to be you know getting more fast break opportunities. Well, the playoffs will begin on April sixteenth, so the Bulls will have some time to rest up and practice. We've seen Zach Levine. Just looked like a shadow of himself. I think he had seven points against the Celtics. And, he, you know, he just doesn't look right out there, Stacey. And I don't think he's going to look right until next season. But the Bulls have to do whatever they can to, to get him at least playing where defenses have to honor his presence on the court. Well, you know, I mean, listen, I mean, I watch this team every night. And, you know, the one thing about their offense is very stagnant. You know, they come down to the half court and, you know, it's the same plays over and over, isolation, a lot of isolation plays. When you're playing against really, really good defensive teams, they can take you out of those games. You know, like Zach, for instance, Zach is, you know, he'll hit these difficult shots. You go, oh, my God, that was a difficult shot. Oh, that was an amazing shot. But most of his shots are being contested. You know, you can, you can come down defensively and contest you know, isolation ball. I'd like to see, you know, you know, Zach and Kobe, especially Kobe getting coming some, off screens, coming off screens, yeah. some single double screens, come off, you know, turn five situations where you run them down there to Vooch and make them, you know, curl off Vooch to pop out. Now you got a post up option there. You got a pick and roll option if you want to bring, you know, Vooch out the screen and go one five pick and roll and get some movement. But having those guys come off single double screens and catch and shoot situations, because Zach, first of all, is one of the better guards in the league at catch and shoot you look at his numbers he's right up there in the top five in catch and shoot opportunities so that to me is imperative that you do that find him some catch and shoot situations where he's coming on the move yeah instead of being an isolation score get yeah. him coming off get screens come off maybe screen. like, be easier on his knee clay, too. clay thompson you know booker you know you watch those guys play they're they're coming off they're not just stand-up shooters or isolation guys they are moving constantly moving they're coming off screens and then if they don't have the jumper they go into their isolation place but pretty much they're looking to get these guys on the move and i think zach is the same way you got to get him moving and get him to play on the go you get Kobe, who had been struggling a little bit with his shot uh, moving. And the thing with Kobe, I think you got to get Kobe more, get his mid-range game going. He, he's gotten away from that. You know, he's it's either a three-point shot or it's a layup. Mm-hmm. And he's passing up a lot because he's getting in the lane. He's getting in the paint where you want your guard to get to to score. And a lot of times he's not looking – when he gets in so deep, Mark, he's not looking to score. He's looking to pass. Sometimes you got to be a little selfish to get yourself going. If you got a little eight-footer – Little runner, teardropper. And I like to see him get back to doing that because they need him to score. They they definitely need – Kobe has to be – when you're big three or you're three guys, you know, DeRozan, Levine, and Vooch, if one of those guys don't score mm-hmm. and not playing good – you got to have Kobe. Someone has to fill that role. Someone has to step up and be that guy. And Kobe is the guy, in my opinion, that has the ability to do that. Patrick Williams, he's still feeling his way around. You he know? looked better against the Bucs. He had 18 in that game at a couple of threes. I love Patrick. I, 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 I'm I a big fan of P-Dub. I think like he's he's got this... You know, he's like he's got this beast inside of him. You know, doesn't unleash it very often. It's, it's like it's like having a Ferrari yeah. and not knowing how to drive it. You know, you're you you get the clutch. <laughs> you know, that's how he is these first couple of years. It's like he has this Ferrari and he, he's got all this ability, 
but he doesn't know how to unleash it. And you see it in in, in flashes, yeah. you know, bits and pieces. Like, oh my God, what a spectacular play! He had a back to back block one time uh, against, I think it was Milwaukee, where you're like, oh my God, that was that was a tremendous play. You know, um, he can push the ball in transition. Um, you watch him go up with one hand and grab a rebound. Like I haven't seen a guy do that like since Michael Jordan. They yeah, that left handed dunk yeah, over the top. Yeah, and he dumped dunked over a seven foot two guy who's a shot blocker who's like the second in in mm-hmm. shot blocks for the Clippers uh, Hardenstein mm-hmm. um, and put him in a basket you know uh, huge hands huge ability and he's he's just I think a lot of it has to do with Patrick's confidence you know con- you know playing with a lot of you know all star caliber players you got Zach you got DeRozan you got Vooch out there and Pat's kind of like well I don't want to step on anybody's toes right sure. even though I'm talented. You know, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna be a good teammate. And sometimes, you know, you got to say to yourself, "I'm just as talented." Yeah. You know, this is the NBA. This is the man's game. No boys allowed. And I can do these things. I can be an elite player in this league. I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes. I'm. I'm gonna do it the right way. I'm gonna come in, prepare. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. You know, lift weights. I'm gonna get stronger. I'm gonna do all the things I have to do off the court to be a great player. But when I come on this court, I'm gonna unleash that beast. And now it's time for me to lease the beast. I'm not being nice no more. This is who I am. You guys can get in the line. You can follow <laughs> me. Uh, or you just sit on the sideline, whatever you want to do. Well, the playoffs, as we mentioned, start on April 16th. On next week's show, we'll break down the series. We'll know who the Bulls' opponent will be. We'll go through all the matchups and go in-depth, getting you ready for round one of the NBA playoffs. One guy we know who is definitely looking forward to the postseason, hasn't seen in a while, is our good buddy Jeff Vukovic. When it comes to insurance for your auto, home, and business, make sure you contact the king of insurance, our buddy, nationwide agent Jeff Vukovic at jeffvuk.com. That's jeffvuk.com. And Stacy's Golden Pipes will be in prime form for the return of postseason basketball to Chicago. Nationwide is on your side. Nationwide is on your side. Oh, no. Okay. There's, okay. There's, <laughs> okay. There's gonna DJ be Pavel. Now. Yeah, there's, oh, my gosh. <laughs> DJ Pavel. He is on the wheel, America. He <laughs> snuck that one in on me. Okay. Yeah, our, our apologies to our good friend Jeff Fugovich. That that's not going to happen again. Yeah, well, we we don't we're not we don't have children working here. There's not a sweatshop in here. We don't have children back here work. So for all your insurance needs, make sure to contact our good buddy Jeff Fugovich. And as Pavel tried to attempt to say, Nationwide <laughs> is on your side. You know who else is on your side? Chris D. Lofton, one of the stars of Power Book 4 Force. That interview coming up next on Gimme the Hot Sauce. <laughs> We are back, episode 73 of Gimme the Hot Sauce. We have a very special guest joining us now, Chicago's very own Chris D. Lofton, joining us, one of the stars of Power Book 4 Force, set right here in Chicago. And Chris, as a guy who grew up in this area, how cool is that to be doing a show on location in the city of Chicago? Mark, man, thank you for the intro, and thank you for adding that D. Like, it's small (laughs) things like that that mean a lot to me. It really does. But like you said... It means a lot being back home, man. Like it, it hits different. It, it it really feels like the epitome of what's meant for you is for you type thing. Because I've auditioned for every power since the original and the spinoff, and oh, I didn't wow. get any of. But I got the one that was in Chicago <laughs> to play a Chicago guy to film in Chicago, not in Vancouver pretending to be Chicago, in Chicago. You know, so it's like it's dope to be sitting on location and we're filming outside and i'm like man i remember walking right here taking the train to go here and now i'm on power filming power in the city here it's like yeah it it, it, it's surreal a part of me still doesn't even feel like it's really happening like i'm it feels like an out-of-body experience like i'm literally watching myself do all of this you know Yeah. yeah oh yeah so, so, so my question, because you said you you auditioned for all the powers, okay? Yes, so, sir. so when you when you were doing that, did you get discouraged? You know, when you didn't come up with those parts, and did you, you know, what was going through your mind when you? I mean, what what roles were you going through for first? Okay, well, uh, uh, the original power audition for Sean for the okay. driver, 50 the driver, yep, Fifty Cent yep. Son. And then in uh, in Tariq's show, 
I auditioned for uh, Professor Reynolds, and I was so mad because I did not want to get it. I was like, bro, they're going to waste their time. You gonna, you gonna, you gotta, you're not going to utilize Chris to the, his fullest potential. Yeah. Get Chris on power and make him be a professor. Yeah. It's not that I can't do it, but I don't want to be on power and be a professor. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm not going to tell the power people that I'm not yeah. doing the audition. I'm going to do it, but let's hope I don't get it. Yeah. And usually as an actor, those are the ones you get. Yeah. When you don't really want it, you'd be like, <laughs> well, they call you back immediately. Chris, they loved you. <laughs> and I'll be like, well, I'll be like, how, really? How? And and that's that's how it happened. So I didn't get that one. And then I auditioned for Raising Canaan, I auditioned for Uncle Lulu and, and Uncle Marvin. I tested for Uncle Marvin and for Uncle Lulu. Didn't get either one of those. The then one I guy looks like you. The one guy, the the, the one of the, the uncles looks like you. Because right. at, at first I thought, at first I thought you had played, you were playing that part. I said, wait a minute, Chris D play that part too. I'm like, man, because you know sometimes they be, they, you know, you advance into another power, another power, you know, because you're a great actor and they like yeah. you and you're convincing. And I, I had to go back and look. And I'm like, man, was he the, the 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 one with the short hair? It's a good yeah, thing Tim or I didn't say that. We'd have all kinds of problems. <laughs> See, you know what, you know what, these guys, man. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. And didn't get that. And then finally this audition came about. And man, I remember I got this audition in October of 2020. And I didn't find out I got it until January 21. Wow. Like, it was a long drawn out process. So throughout that process, I, I'm not gonna say I got discouraged, but there were moments, I think this one would have broke me. If I didn't get this one, yeah. because it was like, I feel like because I told you, I, you know, I started with hardball, so. Yep. I, I kind of have a little bit of tenure in it. It's over 20 years. So I've taken, I've learned to take the personal out of it. Yeah. Everything's not an attack against Chris. Is it, it, A lot of the times it ain't even got nothing to do with you, Chris. Get over yourself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's this didn't work. This didn't line up or this or this or this. So I had to start looking at it more objectively and less like taking it as personal attacks to take myself out of it, to not take it so personal. And then once I grew to that point, I realized, okay, no, don't mean no. It just means not right now. It ain't. It just ain't this one. It's cool. It's cool. But when this audition came, I said, bro, if they don't, if they pick a L.A. dude to be somebody <laughs> from Chicago, I swear, I swear to you, I'm going to have a problem. And that was my biggest thing. I was like, okay, if I don't get it, at least let them be from Chicago. Because I yeah. feel like Chicago and New York are those two cities where it's hard to get somebody from outside yes. to, to be that. Yes, I, I agree with you 100%. That's one of the things I said, because the authenticity of those actors from those particular cities are so important. And you've mm -hmm. got to get that Chicago feel. And, and, and I think the viewers gravitate to you uh, because of that, especially because I'm, I'm here in Chicago. I'm like, I'm rooting on the gap. OK, I, I know there's that situation with you and Tommy. And I'm like, OK, come on now. Y'all got to come together because y'all are my favorite. Y'all my favorite characters. I don't want to see nothing happen to either one of y'all. So you got to you got to work it out, baby. Yeah, we're gonna try to work it out, man. It's gonna be because Diamond, Diamond's watching you. Okay, I just a Diamond watching you. Okay, yeah, Diamond. Now, now you know what's up. Now you know a little bit. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be a crazy last two episodes. We we up this week. We took that week off. Yep. But right back this this Sunday. Yeah, I, I was I was I, I was looking for episode nine. I was like, okay, is it, when, when is episode nine? Because I just got back from the road. I'm like, because I normally tape everything, so I'm like, all right, episode nine. Okay, boom, boom, boom. Man, y'all had me feeling like I was on the doll. Yeah, I was like, I'm over there, like, <laughs> I'm like, I was feeding. I was seriously feeding for. I'm like, they don't got episode nine because there was episode eight, which I already seen twice, and I'm like. Come on, oh man. God. They couldn't have took a week off. Come on, baby. Where you at, baby? I got to get my episode back. <laughs> That's what's up, man. Yeah, I'm excited. I think these last two episodes, gonna, it's going to set the tone, man. It's going to set the tone. And hopefully we'll see for season two. Because the show got picked up for season two. But I don't know about Jannar. We got two episodes to find out if Jannar going to be there. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I really, you know, because you never know, because I mean, you watch these these great shows and like Game of Thrones really set that off for me where, you know, you're watching Game of Thrones and they're killing off their main characters like in the first episode. And you're like, what the hell? You know, Ned yeah. Stark, he got yeah. beheaded in the first, the first, not even the first <laughs> season was over. Right. And I was like, I was digging Ned Stark. And so I was mad. And I'm like, I ain't watching this crap anymore, but I still kept watching. But every one of their star characters was always a threat to be killed. And, it, but it bro. had you coming in watching it all the time. Mm -hmm. Nobody's safe in power. That's 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 the like you know the running gag 
amongst all the cast and crew. That's what we say to each other. Even I'm friends with a lot of the people on the other shows, like my boy Woody, who yeah. plays Kane on Ghost. Okay. That's Oh, man, him like this. Me and Michael Rainey are cool. And we, we'll say that to each other. We'd be like, man, you know, nobody say for power. <laughs> nobody, ain't nobody say for power. You you come to work on a Thursday and read a script and it's all good. You come yeah. to work on Friday and read the script and you got a bullet in, in your eye. <laughs> yeah. Because how does that work? Like when you <laughs> here you are coming to work one day and you like think everything's good, but you, you know there could be some trouble because the way the episodes have gone up to. And yeah. then you come into work, man, and then it'd be like, oh, yeah, we're going to shoot you tomorrow. Well, You're like Vic's die. girlfriend got taken out yeah. the last episode. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, Vic's girlfriend yeah. got killed. I was yeah. glory. I was like, wait, wait yeah. a minute. That yeah. can't happen. That was a shocker for us, bro. Like, we didn't. But see, what they do is they don't just, like, necessarily spring it on us. At least that first season, they tried to um, give us a little bit of a heads up. Like, if, if they knew one of us was going to die that next episode, they, if we were dying in episode five, they would tell us in episode four. Okay, okay. It's like, look, this is what's happening in this episode, and your care. This is what's happening next episode. Oh man! Oh man! Stuff to come to work with. Yeah, you yeah. Happening. That's depressing. <laughs> oh, this is my last day on the job. Oh, you mommy gonna kill me, man? I thought you liked me. I to tell you, that is awesome though. What I used to do is every time we would do our table read before every episode, you know, we sit down as a cast and just read through the entire script from front to back. And literally every time we would do that, I would just flip to the end. <laughs> like the Am I still <laughs> good? I still see my name. Like, what, Janar? Oh, yes. Yes, made it through another one. I'd be like, yes, made it through another one. I, I just think that the dynamic between you and Diamond is so important to the show because the fact that he was gone for so long and he was doing a bid, and then you had to keep everything afloat as the younger brother and mm -hmm. make sure that it didn't get taken over. You guys didn't get ran over by another crew and you kept everything in place. And now after all these years, he's coming back and you got that brother dynamic, but then you also got that business dynamic. Like we trying to, we trying to do business here and you kind of messing up business. I love you, my brother, but yeah. You know, you kind of been away longer than you've been here. I kind of, uh, you, you might yeah. be a stranger to me. Yeah. Know, you know, you might, you, you might be a stranger to me. <laughs> yeah. You know? That's that, that's know? what it, that's what it seems like. And that's what people don't, I, I'm glad that you said that because it's like, uh, I tried to humanize Jannard. I didn't want to make him just like this dude who's mad all the time. Yeah. I'm just mad at Tommy because who are you? Like, nah, it's like, Tommy could have been anybody and he yeah. could have been white, brown, purple or pink. It doesn't matter. It was more so about the fact that some people need that validation. It's like a kid who's waiting on his father to say, I'm proud of you, son, but he never does. <laughs> yeah, That's how Nard feels about Diamond. It's like, look, I've been doing this 15 years and you ain't even said thank you yet. You just trying to come back and take it over, not be my partner, but you want to be my boss again. Yeah. But now you running around playing partner with this new nigga that yeah. nobody knows yeah. and not me. Yeah. That's where the problem is. It's not Tommy. We don't even know Tommy. Yeah. He came from our city. I don't know him. Yeah. So it's not Tommy could have literally been anybody and Jannard would have felt away because he's still waiting on that I'm proud of you, son, moment that yeah. just ain't coming. That's just not coming. I, I think the, the animosity coming. I think that the fight scene that you guys had in the boxing ring, that yeah, was that was, was that good. was climactic. I, I was like, because you know, having you know three brothers, you know. That's, you know, there's all this competition growing up when you have brothers, you know, so yep. if you got an older brother, you're always trying to get, you know, idolize your older brother. You're trying to be like your older brother. And then you do have those little personal beasts as you get older and you go into young men and, and the older brother still thinks he can do the same thing to the little brother he did when you was little. But you like, yep. nah, nah, that, nah, I'm not that little boy anymore. And that's, and that's what that scene was all about. And anybody who has brothers can relate to that scene. Mm -hmm. And they and they worked us, bro. Like, and that's another thing I want people to know. There wasn't no stunt doubles, though. That was me and Isaac in there brawling. Like, I'm talking about they they had us in. I took MMA classes for three to four months while we was filming. Oh wow! And he, they had him in boxing training for three to four months. So we really, and then they had that whole choreographed fight scene that we had to learn, learn every step and every and where the camera was gonna be and and not to throw the punch too far off because if we do, we're going to block the camera because it's going to be right here. So it's like a dance. We had to learn the whole thing and just go through it, you know? And so that's what I was real proud of that moment. Like he, 
He actually ended up hitting me once on one of them takes, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He hit me. He hit me 100% one time. And Isaac is not a, he make me look small on TV. Yeah, That's he's a big before. dude. He seemed like a big That's dude. A, you know, he former NFL. Yeah. Yeah, he played in the NFL for a while. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Hey, let's talk about your athletic background. Reading your bio, it said you, you, know, you played high school sports, could have gone to college and, and, and competed athletically, but you decided to pursue the showbiz route. Uh, you were writing songs when you were in grade school. Yeah. Um, what, what was your real passion growing up? What, what did you enjoy most as a kid? My real passion was always sports. Like, I was a sports kid. That was it. I played baseball and football. I played a little bit of basketball, but then – it was, uh, you know, about those those West Suburban schools, sure. uh, St. Yeah. St. Joe's. I got recruited by Coach Ping to nice. go to oh, basketball wow. at St. Joe's because I'm from Bellwood, Westchester. That's where I grew up. Okay. So I would pull on all those, like, you know, traveling teams and those AAU teams yeah. in the summer. And then Coach Ping recruited me. But I was so silly. I didn't want to go to an all-boy Christian high school. I was like, <laughs> no, I want to go to the public school. Mama, send me to Proviso West. Oh. And then I went to Proviso West with all those kids where the damn basketball tryout line was a 1,000 people long. <laughs> I, was like, well, I ain't got time for this. So I was like, I, I don't have time for this. And, and I'm coming from Westchester where I was like the star of the basketball team. And I was like, you want me to try out against a 1,000 people? I was yeah. like, you know what? I'm going to go on this baseball field and kill all of y'all. That's what I'm going to yeah. do. Put me, put me in center field, coach. So I focused on baseball and football in high school. And then, yeah, I got that I got that scholarship to go to Grambling because I'm a country dude kind of a little bit. Even though, you know, we're from Chicago, but that great migration, we all came from, by the yes. way, Mississippi or something. Yes, yes. So, you know, so I wanted to be in the SWAC. It was my dream to go play football in the SWAC and marry one of them blue and gold dancers from Southern. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was my little fantasy in my head. I had it all planned, Stacey. I had it all planned. That's what you have to understand. I had it planned. Hey, I ain't mad at you. <laughs> so, that wasn't so, a bad plan. Yeah, man. I was like, man, I want to play ball. So that was my true passion. But I did music as well. I was a rapper before I left Chicago. I had my songs on WGCI. I was doing single release parties as a whole rapper. I was still acting, but I was doing that way, way more. But it, it became a point where it was like, OK, the image that I want to portray as a rapper is in direct confliction with the image that these agents and managers want me to have as an actor, right. yeah. you know? There's, we expect more of an actor because you're well, an actor. Yeah. <laughs> well, then no, you did play a great uh, j job uh, as Kassan as a football player, and that uh, must have translated a little bit. Exactly, and that's what I used that for Kassan. I was like, okay, if I would have went to the league and possibly the wild Chris I was from 17 to 23, if you would have gave that Chris a $50 million bank account and, and he had the talent on the field that he did, and then I just took a couple of my homies who play in the league, like Aqib Tlaib and like the OBJs and stuff like that. And I mixed all of their personalities into how wild I think I would have been had I not grown up and got 50 million straight, like at 20. Oh, yeah. Turn on the cameras. I got Kassan. I got him. I was like, I was like <laughs> And that's, that's kind of how I played it. So, yeah, that but that was beautiful. And that's why I love acting, because I could still play out all of those things that I wanted to do, you know. But in the time, in the moment when it happened, when I chose acting over sports, I was just one of them kids that you know how your mom would say, Stacy, that boy done been here before. You been yeah, here before. yeah, yeah. I was one of them old thinking old souls. Kids. So I was 17 years old. I emancipated myself. Like, not on no Macaulay Coke and I hate you, mom. Not like that. Yeah. But I need to be able to sign this contract, mom, because, you you know, you, you messed up an opportunity for me and I need to be able to make that decision for myself. You know, yeah. like, so let me sign. Let me let's do this. And I looked at it like, OK, I've been playing sports my whole life. It's been about 17, 18 years of it. This is all I know. I don't know how to do nothing else. I play sports. I don't know how to do nothing else. Not a trade. I know how to play sports. And I say, let's say I go out here to college and I'm not as good as I think I am. The competition is increased to another level. And maybe you're not as good as you think you are. Or you go out there and get hurt and you can't perform the way you once could. Yeah. Then what? Those people still got jobs. And then in baseball, it's different than other sports. Yeah. You know, they got rookie ball, the tr single A, yeah, double A, yeah. triple A. If you don't make it to the MLB, those people in single A work at like CVS in the offseason. Yeah. And I, I'm like, I don't want to do that. And I say, Mom, if I'm an actor, though, there's no shelf life. 
your career in sports is over at about 35 to 40 is the cap. Yeah. I said, there's no shelf life. I said, Ma, I don't have to be Will Smith to never work again. I could be somebody that nobody ever recognizes, but I never have to go to work. I can yeah. do whatever I want to do and do what I love and pay for my bills. And, and, mm -hmm. and long my rent is paid. I have money to eat and I got a little bit of extra little disposable income. And I was OK with that. If millions end up coming, then great. I'm not going to turn it down. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I didn't need it to me. That was good enough to just know that I didn't have to go to work and there was no shelf life. If I go out here and get out of shape, Stacy, I get 350 pounds tomorrow. There's a role for the fat dude. I'm starting <laughs> to fall down. If it goes all the way off, it's a role for the bald dude. Yeah. If I'm 50 years old, as long as I'm still able body and I can walk and talk, there's a role for the old dude. Yeah. If I go out there and get hit by a bus and I'm paralyzed, there's a role for the man in a wheelchair. Wow. I can do this until the day I die. That, you can't do that with sports. No, that, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, it's really good to hear that because, like, especially here you grow you grew up in chicago you know how tough the gang situation is here in the inner city being in the inner city how tough it is and how many you know the kids growing up you know they feel like there's no choices for them there's no options for them if they're not rapping and playing sports there's nothing else for them to do and really and there cool. is you know yeah, there is <clears throat> there is something for them to do and you know they idolize us but i think kids seeing you on power and seeing you know where you come from they look at you and go Hey, he's from here. He, you know, he yeah. walked these same streets that I walk, and he's an actor. I can do that because the, the choices now, and you know this too, Chris, is that is playing sports or you want to be a rapper or you in gangs. Those are your choices, and they, they're yeah. in their eyes, there is no other choices but that. But there are choices, and yeah. you opening up, you know, being a, a vessel to show these younger kids being from Chicago uh, and cause everybody's watching that show. All these young kids watch, you know, ghosts and power and Tommy and force and all this. They watch those shows. So it's yeah. great to see you doing what you're doing and then being a vessel for these young kids here in the city to see that they can do other things. Yeah, bro. Cause that's, it meant a lot to me, bro. Like, <clears throat> cause like you said, I was that kid who felt like that was all I can do until I ended up going to a random open call audition for hardball. And I got it. I didn't think that. I was like, wait a minute. That that messed up my whole thought process. I was like, wait, we can be on TV? Nobody nobody said nothing like that. And this is in 99. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, that was unheard of. Like, wait, what? Movies? TV? I was, I was an actor when people was making fun of me in high school for being an actor. You know uh, what I'm saying? Yeah. It wasn't cool yet. It was before social media when everybody realized that you can monetize and do this and do this and everybody was an influencer. No. I was an actor when everybody was like, you say you about to go do what? Yeah. Oh, okay. This he weird. Like what? You about to go do what? <laughs> yeah. Now I you get to work lame. with all those legends. Was, everybody's calling me a lame. Now yeah. everybody wants to be an actor. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I went through that transition, but it opened my eyes up, and that's why I, I owe hardball so much because it literally it saved my life and changed my life. You know, it, it opened me up, and now I do have that position and that responsibility i owe it to my city and to these kids to show them and i feel like in the black community things don't seem that attainable until we can see someone else have it yes. it has to be close to us our uncle or our friend or somebody we know has to have a car like that he gotta have that rolls royce yeah. my uncle gotta have a million dollars in order for me to think that it's even possible yeah yeah you know what i'm saying yeah and that's the part to me that i want to hit home and i and that's why <laughs> when we were filming season one I didn't go talk to those schools yet. I said, you know what? Let's wait until it comes on TV to when it'll actually resonate with yes. the kid. Yes. Let's not do it now just for the sake of doing it, just to say I'm doing it. No, I want it to mean something. Yes. Because I remember when I was that kid in high school and I saw that artist when I still wanted to be a rapper and I saw that artist come to our school and rap on stage and, and do this. When I was at the Chicago theater working production staff for Ellen DeGeneres bigger longer wider show and I saw Kanye walk on stage and perform how that changed my whole and he don't even know it like but that changed my life just standing there watching him do that I was like it has to be this I said that has to be me and and that was it and I and I wouldn't take no for an answer after moments like that so I'm very conscious and aware of how much something that means so little to other people can mean so much to somebody else and what it could truly do for that kid who just doesn't know yet. Yeah, that's that's so important because, you know, being a professional athlete, 
you know, I think sometimes it's lost the impact that we have on people. That's why I take it very seriously. And when I meet kids or anybody, you know, because that when you meet somebody, you don't know what it's doing to them personally. You don't know the impact that you have on that person until they happen to tell you like, hey, it was because of you. I did this or I did that. I got into broadcasting. It's because of you. You know, I, I started playing basketball and that makes you as an individual feel really good about yourself. Like you, you didn't even know, like you didn't even know you're making these impacts on people, yeah. but you take it seriously. And, and the good thing about it too, Chris, is that, you know, you're doing it the right way. You know, you're grinding, you know, you're not, you didn't, you know, not going to hit a home run every single time you get up there. You're going to have to, how many, how many, you know, casting calls have you gone to and you talked right. about it earlier that you didn't get and that you could have yeah. easily said, you know what, forget this. I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go back out of here and, you know, do something on the streets and, you know, make some money on the side because that's yeah. always an option if you don't continue and you don't want to do that grind. Exactly, bro. We You got to let go of that. I had to let go of instant gratification, worrying about instant gratification because I moved to L.A. with a one way ticket, three hundred dollars in a backpack and slept on the floor and was standing on Hollywood Boulevard selling hoverboards and 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 getting people on the train, catching people about to put a fifty dollar bill on a on a bus card ticket like, hey, hey, don't do that. I got this gift card. I'll I'll put 50 on there if you give me twenty five in cash so I can oh, eat yeah. today. You know, like I was out there doing that. I was at the I was working at the hotel by LAX mixing waffle batter for the continental breakfast, making eggs before I booked a month before I booked ballers. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like I was like I grinded, bro, taking the bus three hours one way to a job paying me 10, 25 an hour because I had to do it. And that's just what it is. It just it just is what it is, bro. Like you, you, you got to do it. Yeah. You, you, I, and I had to. And. I think it is important, bro. It, it just really is important to show people that it's possible. That's my biggest thing. I want to stay as relatable as possible. I never want to be disconnected because the moment you become too disconnected is the moment you lose and you lose yourself. And and I'm not going, you know, because I don't want it that bad, Stacey. I've been I've been broke my whole life. Hell, it took me 20 years to get here. I've been broke yeah. my whole life. Yeah. I want it that bad. Y'all can have it back, <laughs> you know, if, yeah. it, if it's going to be compromised everything. I can't go. That's a, that's a good mindset, too, because, you know, when you have that kind of mindset, you appreciate the little things, you know, you appreciate the little things, you know, and, yeah. and you know, I, when I talk to some of these, you know, coming up, you know, coming up from nothing myself and then, you know, going to college and then being, you know, all American basketball player and then getting drafted by the Bulls and right. seeing seeing things come so fast. You know, money coming so fast, the fame coming so fast. And if you don't have a good support group, you know, a good foundation to keep you grounded, you know, your mom, your dad, your brothers, sisters, whatever, a, a good supporting unit, man, you will float off and disappear. Yeah, bro. And and that's why I say I try to stay connected. And like you said, it's the small things. I know there was this guy. He, he told me this story. A guy, one of my Instagram followers, his name Jamar. This dude said that. Chris, I, I jumped in one of your lives in 2017. You, were, you weren't even doing this yet. You were talking about how you wanted to do this and what you were going to do. I was in prison watching that live, Chris. Wow. And I was watching your live, and the reason I found your page is because Meet the Browns came on on the TV in prison. And I said, I like that dude right here. And I found your Instagram. And I saw you were going live, and I watched it. And I responded to you and you actually responded to me, Chris, and you talked to me every single time I DM you, you respond. And I got out of prison and I started a trucking company and I'm, I got I'm up to four. I'm up to six 18 wheelers now. And I got married to the girl that held me down when I got out. And now I have a successful trucking company. I just bought this Corvette with cash. I sent my pay for my daughter to go to college, Chris. And you motivated me through watching your story. And I just hosted a party in Jackson, Mississippi. And that same dude said, what, Chris, I'm pulling up to that party. I'm driving from Memphis to meet you finally in person. And then he gave me a gift. He gave me like some nice sunglasses. Like, and I met him in person and it was all love. And it was literally because he watched a live while he was in prison. And he said, I changed his life. Wow. And I'm like, wow. And to this day, like I said, bro, here's my number. Hit me up anytime. He coming to my birthday party, probably in Chicago <laughs> this year. Like that, wow. like this, like in real life, bro. Like I'm not, yeah. I'm not that dude. And that's what I tell people when people, they always hit me in the DMs like, oh my God, I can't believe you responded. I'm like, I'm still a real person. Yeah. 
yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to purposely not respond to people. I'm going to try my hardest. It's getting to the point now where I'm realizing that it might not be possible to yeah. respond to everybody. Yeah. But I, I'm still the guy who cares enough. And I'm really and it's not my assistant. It's not. No, it's me. And it's good. Yeah, and, and I'm that guy. And I'm gonna always be that dude. I don't want nobody else speaking for me ever in any situation. And you know what's cool about that is and I'm the same kind of person. Like, I respond to everybody on Twitter. I respond to everybody <laughs> on Instagram. You know, but the people respect you. you you're a man of the people. And people yep. always love you. They always support you because you're real. And that's yep. what it's all about. It's like, it doesn't matter about the fame and, and how famous you are, how much money you are. You know, people remember you're a good dude. My mom always told me when I was coming up, when I was a little shorty, she used to tell me, she said, you know, when you meet someone, you know, you want to make an impression on that person that when you leave, they say that is a nice young man. That is a good person there. And I've That's always it. lived by that code. So, you know, there's some people out there, Chris, as you know, they, they, don't, they don't like you. They may not like you, you know, for whatever reason. They don't know you. But then when they happen to run across you and meet you, they go, man, I really thought you were a jerk or, you know, da-da-da. And then all of a sudden I met you. Man, you are a really cool dude. You know, I, I'm really impressed with how you are and handling yourself. And I, I lead the same kind of way, man. I, I feel like, you know, like the United Center, prime example, the security after the game. I've been doing it probably for – since I was a player. But after the game, I sign autographs and take pictures with fans. And yeah. United Center security, you know, they they as tight as a thong on a sumo wrestler. They be trying to get everybody out of there. <laughs> oh, I got here, got here. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I purposely make them stop. Like, no, because you know what? You know what? These people pay their hard-earned money to come to this game. And this might be their only oh, opportunity. Oh, exactly. You owe it to them because these are the people who make you who you are as a person. Yeah. And and I, and I always remind myself of this too, Stace, that it's not this person's fault who watches me every Sunday that today my girlfriend is getting on my nerves and I'm yes. just not in the mood. That ain't their problem, Chris. Yep. They don't they don't know that, and that's not even their problem, Chris. You gotta you gotta get over yourself. Yep. And and it's, and it's hard. That's why I take special people to do it, Stacy. Yep. Because it's hard, but you and you gotta understand that that's not their problem. That Chris is having a shitty day. Yeah. But yeah. it doesn't matter. That person, that person watches you all the time. And even with the United Center, bro, we almost missed the the whole third and fourth quarter because at halftime, me and Bart was walking to go get food and stuff, and it just turned into a whole thing. Yeah. And people was like, I can't believe y'all are just walking around here, no security. I'm like, bro, we really from Chicago. Yeah. Like, we're, yeah, we're just walking. We walked through the whole stadium, bro, just me and Bart by ourselves yeah. and took – Thousands of pictures and videos, thousands of them to the point where we didn't get back to the suite until I think it was seven minutes to go in the fourth. But we left at halftime. Yeah. Missed that whole thing because it was we were just taking pictures with people. But see, here's the thing they don't people don't understand about guys from Chicago or, or anybody in general. When you treat people the right way and you respect people, they respect you. So you'll be able to walk through the crowd and not worry about someone, you know, trying to hurt you or you know, because they know you're not about that. They'll jump on you if you do. Bro. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> oh, exactly. It's the same thing. Like if somebody, if somebody on Twitter says something to me that that uh, my Twitter followers don't don't like, oh my God, you open up a can of whoop ass because they are they are on you. <laughs> they are on you. They are not gonna let you get away with. I ain't got to say nothing. I just like, okay, whatever. And then all of a sudden, man, a hundred people, wow, they just be like, like <laughs> rabid dogs. They own them. Yeah, man. And that's dope. Like that. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta be a man of the people. And that's, that's kind of how that's, that's the route I'm playing it, man. I, I'm a man of the people and I'm them. That's what I want people to realize. I, cause I honestly feel like if they let me on TV, you can too. Like yeah. I want to be the example. I want to be the example. Like, bro, if Chris did it, I did it, bro. Like, I, I feel like I did it. Yeah, You definitely can do it. And that's what I used to tell some of my friends. I'd be like, bro, move to L.A. I need I need you out here. And they'd be like, oh, man, what you got? What you got lined up? I'm like, I don't have nothing lined up. I'm still auditioning for stuff, but I need you out here. Move out here with me. Oh, man. No, nah, you know, holler at me when you get a, something steady, yeah. man. I got to be able to pay for this and that. It's like, nah, bro, like the grind. Yes, yes. <laughs> The yeah. grind, none of that matters. <laughs> I like it at the baseball, man. Like everybody wants to get up and hit a home run because home runs are sexy. But you sometimes you just got to get on the base. If it's you get hey, hit by a pitch, you, you got to walk. Go to the Hall of Fame hitting singles. Yeah, exactly. Each row, uh, each row <laughs> gonna be in Hall of Fame. You got over three thousand hits. You can still win a ring hitting singles, man. Yeah, exactly. And I'm cool with that. 
Hey, me so, too. You know, there's two type of people. There's people who don't mind making $3 million with a partner and some people who'd rather make $750,000 alone. I'm the dude. I'd rather make $3 million with a partner, my yep. guy. You know me what I'm too. saying? <laughs> yeah. Some people rather take the $750 with no partner, though. Yeah. And that's, that's two, that's, you know, different strokes for different folks. Exactly. It exactly. sounds like Stacy and Whispers with the Give Me the Hot Sauce Project. Oh, right. oh baby. That's right. You like hot Stacey's sauce? You like hot sauce? Signature hot I love sauce. Hot sauce. Okay. So, you know, I got my own signature hot sauce because, you know, I don't just say it in the yeah. game now. I got my own signature hot sauce. We got four flavors. We got a barbecue sauce. We got a, a super hot sauce we just came out with last week. We got a, yeah. uh, a green sauce, which I my personal favorite because I like Mexican food. So, it's my sauce of St. Pat's Verde. Uh, and then we got the, a regular hot sauce for the people who don't like the hot hot sauce. So it's mild, but you, yeah. our, our guest on the show always. We always send our guest on the show uh, for coming on the show. We always make sure we I, get cooking, we hook you I'm, up. We yeah. hook you up I'm, with four I'm, bottles. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I'm gonna make some <laughs> wings and I'm gonna toss them in that. There oh, you go. They are. Hey, I'm gonna tell you something. My girl, my girl Don made me some wings with the hot sauce on it. Oh Lord, have mercy! It make you want to <laughs> slap your mama, but don't <laughs> slap her though. Don't slap her. Hey. Just tell her mama they good. Yeah, mama, they good. Hey, I'm, I'm, I just looked at my air fryer right now. Yeah, the air fryer, baby. Oh, everybody got to have air right fryer. I'm like, damn, I yes. want some now. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> we we gonna hook you up with uh, we gonna give it all the hot sauce, man, for having coming on the show, man. This is I can sit here and talk to you all day, bro. Like hey, seriously, hey, Chris, it's, it's, it's Chris, awesome. I got a I got a business idea for you. What's up? How about uh, tattoos? Temporary tattoos women put on their feet. What? <laughs> that's uh, I love that. that. <laughs> Chris, okay. Chris, Chris can talk. About We're having a nice that? conversation. Yeah. He has to go see, over there. see, see, this is one of the reasons why we don't allow whispers to really talk. <laughs> you know, no, no, you got to let Chris answer that. He knows something about me. I think he I, knows more than he's letting on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> in interviews that I'm a sucker for top of the foot tattoos. Oh, okay. So that, is a great business idea. <laughs> I, like I thought you'd like it. Don't that. humor him, man. <laughs> All right, Chris, we'll talk later. Like a six to at least an eight or nine. <laughs> a perfectly placed foot tattoo. Oh, it yeah. Can send you, it can send you through the roof. Oh, <laughs> I, I hear you. <laughs> He's a freak. I'm just gonna throw it's that like out there. White toes. If they got the white toes with yeah. the top of the tattoo, oh my God, Stacy, I lose it. I hey, don't know. It's I tell you, I, I don't mind a good tattoo. If they got bunions, put them on the bunions. I don't want to see nobody bunions. That's just me. I'm sorry. Put that tattoo on the bunion. Uh, make it an eye or a face or something. I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my girl over here looking at me all crazy. You ain't got no bunions, girl. You good? <laughs> oh, Gotta keep happy home. <laughs> Jeez. Happy wife, happy life. Yes, sir. <laughs> Ski. You know how that go, baby. What do you think about them Bulls before we let you go? Oh man, I'm happy we in. I'm sad that Lonzo ain't. He gonna miss yeah. the remainder. That's 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 oh, tough, bro. And, and what's crazy is we showed just how important he was. Yes. You know, I love my boy Kobe, but Lonzo is just an important piece. Yes. He's a, a very important piece that I think a lot of us Chicagoans took for granted. Yeah. We thought yeah. like, no, nah, you know, DeMar out there going crazy. Zach going crazy. We got Booch. And it was like when Lonzo left, it kind of started to go the other way. And you started to see a little bit of things that needed work. You know what I'm saying? And we lost a lot of guys, man. Pat Will just came back. So it, I'm rooting for us. And I hope, you know what I'm saying? I'm glad Cleveland lost because now we in regardless, even though we lost that Milwaukee game because Cleveland lost to Orlando, right? Yeah, they lost to Orlando. So that's why we we snuck on in there anyway. We backed so in. Just, beep, beep, yeah. beep. Yeah, man. So I'm excited. <laughs> I, I, I definitely want to see what we do with it. And I'm rooting for the home team all day, man. It's tatted on me. Chicago bully right oh, here. Oh, okay. There you go. It's tatted on me. Oh, that's nice. It it's that's home. That's nice. Yeah, man. So, it, it, like, I'm rooting. I'm rooting. But, you know, we're going to see. Uh, we need Lonzo, I think. Here, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, Chris, is I, and I tell Bulls fans this all the time because, you know, we're not – Chicago Bulls fans are not fair-weather fans. You know, they ride or die until the wheels fall off, okay? We're not like right. New York. We're not like Los Angeles. They're, they're a different fan. They're, I consider them the best fans in the world. Um, they stay loyal to the team. And I, I tell people all the time who may be discouraged, you know, some of the casual fans, you know, on Twitter, is like, hey, you got to understand, this team won 31 games last year. They won 26 the year before. It, it's been a while since they've been good. 
And then all of a sudden now, you know, we jumped up 15 wins. There's levels to this, just like there's levels in acting. You got to pay your dues to get you got to. There's going to be tears. There's going to be bloodshed. There's I mean, there's going to be pain. People think we just walked out there and won world championships. It didn't go like that. We had to go through we had to go through teams to get to that level. We had to get beat by Detroit a few times before we were able to finally push through. And They're so yeah. exactly, and it's character building. It's character building. And so yeah. this team is going through character building situations right now. And I think because the way they got off to such a great start, it kind of got all the people who who kind of been hiding in the in the woodwork with their bulls jacket like I'm come the bulls are nice now. I'm gonna put my jacket back on. <laughs> <laughs> but but the true yeah. fans have been with them, you know, since you know since they were losing. So um, I try to temper everybody. Like yo, you gotta understand, the new front office is doing a great job. Yeah, yeah they, and, no, they and, truly are. And that Caruso pickup was so clutch. Oh, I think huge! How much, when when Lonzo and Caruso got hurt, bro, it all just and people look at Caruso and say like, okay, he's not dropping twenty points, but you see how important he is. He was the Draymond. Yes. To our system. yes yes he was the Draymond in our system. And he was also like when Igadala still won MV Finals MVP, even though Steph was out there dropping fifty. That was that was Caruso. He was he would have won the Finals MVP like I Igadala, even though DeRozan was out there scoring the fifty points. It still should have went to Caruso because yeah. without him, we wouldn't have won all them games. Well, and when he was gone, we weren't. Well, the good thing about it is they're back and they're going to be able to get some quality free agents uh, to come here because before we couldn't get anybody to come here because no one wanted to come to a rebuilding situation. They've been watching this team now. They see the excitement back into it. This is a packed arena every night uh, on the road. We got more fans on the road than the home team does. I mean, we travel oh, yeah. Chicago. We travel deep. You know, Bro, I mean, we LA, we played out in L.A. Yeah, yeah, we were out in L.A. playing the Clippers and the Lakers on the back-to-back yeah. -back night. I thought we was at home. I mean, there were so yeah. many Bulls fans in the stands, and that's been like that all the, all this whole year. And people are so excited, you know, worldwide that the Bulls are relevant again because the NBA ain't NBA ain't really nothing unless the Bulls are in, in the in the in the playoffs and New York Knicks. Those two teams have to be in the in Boston. Those three teams yeah. have to be in the playoffs for, for, in my opinion, for it to be relevant. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that you say that because now the Lakers aren't in it. No. No. I, I'm going to pull up a or tweet. Or the Knicks. I, put, I took that picture. When they took that weak team picture and Rondo was holding the ball, I <laughs> quoted it and I said, this won't work. And then I put the picture when they had Gary Payton and Carl Malone and Kobe and Shaq, and they thought they was going to do something. I said, looks like history is about to repeat itself. And everybody <laughs> yep. was laughing at me when I tweeted that, Stacey. Like, before the season started, I tweeted that. I said, it won't work. Nah, you're right. You're right. I don't understand how they thought it would work. <laughs> well, because, you know, I mean, LeBron, and I love LeBron, but I get tired of hearing the LeBron and MJ comparisons. There is no comparisons, okay? You know, LeBron is LeBron will be considered one of the greatest players ever to play, but he will never, in my opinion, it was supplant MJ. MJ. MJ did it the right way. MJ took his lumps, took his beatings, and for seven years, and then finally, finally found a way of getting some teammates on it through the draft. Jerry Krause doesn't get a, enough attention of that. They put a team around him, and then he was able to bust through. And once he got one, it was it was off and running. And to be honest with you, I tell people this all the time: Had he not went to go chase curveballs with the White Sox, they would have won those two championships that Houston has. And you're looking at eight. Oh, when Eight Scottie in a row. Back in that year. Yeah, that was when Scotty was up. Yes, MVP yes. Left. Right. And it was a one bad call. One bad call away from Hugh Hollins. Hugh, if you're listening, I'm sorry. I'm putting you on front street. One bad call. And it's karma because Hubert Day was the one day that he got fouled in North Carolina didn't win the NCAA championship. So karma, the basketball guys paid it back, baby. Oh, I'm sorry, Hubert. I love you, boy, but the basketball guys got you, boy. <laughs> Stacy, bringing it full circle. Uh, and sure I'm going to bring it full circle now. Chris, thank you so much for sharing your story, your amazing career, all the things you've done at a very young age. And we are rooting so hard for Jannard to survive those last two yes. episodes and be <laughs> hey, back I'm for season to... two. Yes. Hey, Mark, we're legit, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to. I got my fingers crossed. We're going to see. Yeah. No spoiler. So yeah. I want to tell everybody, check it out on Stars. It's on Sunday night, and then you can catch all the older episodes on demand. It's just a great series. It's a great show. It's power, book four, force, 
with star and our guy Chris D. Lofton. So thank Chicago's you so much for Chicago's own, us. baby. Yeah, Chicago's own, very own. And they bringing the hot sauce, baby. And we're going to give you some hot sauce. <laughs> so text me your address where you want me to send it, and we'll ship it out to you uh, in the next couple of days. Yes, sir, man. I appreciate it, dog. And I'm going to be here, hopefully, again for season two. So when I do, I'm going to hit you. All right. Remember what I told you? If you when you want to go to a game, you got my number. Boy, hook me up. I'll, I'll make sure you get in there. <laughs> I make sure you love, man. I appreciate you, Jake. All right, boy. All love, man. Yeah, keep doing your, man, keep doing your thing. So much, bro. Thanks, Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Former baseball star. Baseball season is underway. We'll talk about the Cubs and White Sox a little bit when Give Me the Hot Sauce rolls on. Welcome back, episode 73 of Give Me the Hot Sauce. Chris D. Lofton couldn't have been nicer. Oh, and then when Whistlers hit him with that question about the foot tattoo, I, uh, I almost fell off the chair. You know what? We, we got a research department. I know. First of all, <laughs> first of all, research, you did, the first time ever, 73 shows he did some research. Okay? America. <laughs> wow. America. First of all, first of all, I'm over here hitting Mark Sinowski's yeah. little kill button. Yeah. Kill him. Kill him. Get him off now. He's getting ready to say something crazy. Oh, my God. And he, then it slipped out. I'm like, he's talking about fear. Feet. Yeah, like Rex oh, Ryan. Oh, yeah. I was like, freak. <laughs> freak. Oh, we, Rex would have been proud. Yeah, he oh, he really? He's probably giving you a standing ovation. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Oh, <laughs> those are my kind of show. I'm going to subscribe to Give Me the Hot Sauce Bar. Yeah, they're talking about feet. Oh, my God. He caught me off guard with that one. But he liked it. He yeah, yeah, he did. That topic. Yeah, yeah. You guys yeah, should go into business together, you freaks. So we learned a lot about Christy Lofton. No question yeah. about it. And he was a fantastic guest. He was. Awesome. Hey, the great story going on in the world of sports is the Masters this week. It's always interesting, but just an incredible story. Tiger Woods, 14 months after a near-fatal car accident, is playing golf, and he's playing well. I watched a lot of round one today. We're taping this show on Thursday afternoon. He shot 100 par 71. It could have been lower. He just didn't make a lot of putts. He's four shots behind the lead, and I think he's got a chance to contend. He, he looks really good out there. It's amazing. I tell you what, I mean, remarkable that he's even in position to play, and he's here. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that was a that was a deadly crash. Yeah, and you know, you know, God was with him. You, you look know? at the wreckage; it's amazing he yeah. survived. Yeah, a lot of people, a lot of experts said they don't know how he yeah. survived there, that crash. There was a debate on the scene to amputate his leg. If they couldn't yes. get the dash off the one leg, they were going to cut it off. They got a enough of a tool in there and that was a close call i mean it was and even afterwards they didn't know if they could save the leg right after because there's so damage. much damage yeah. under the nerves yeah i'll tell you what it's it's remarkable to see him out there like just to even the the thought process of him coming up this week to trying to decide if he was going to play or yeah. not and just watching him hit on the range is like man golf needs this guy like they definitely need him there there's a lot of great players out yeah. there but there's something about Tiger Woods. He brings a totally different like energy to the golf course. As someone said he doesn't move the needle. He is the needle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he is. He well, is. That's, that's like when Mike Tyson was at his heyday boxing. People yeah. just, just couldn't turn away. They just wanted to see what he was going to do. Oh, I, I even mm -hmm. like, you know, we were just talking about it on the ride over here in our, our great Windy City uh, limousine. Uh, we were talking about Conor McGregor being that way. Mm -hmm. You know, the UFC, mm -hmm. you know, people complain about, you know, the fighters complain about, you know, Conor McGregor when he, because he, he can make the decision when he wants to fight, who he wants mm -hmm. to fight. Guy can miss three years and get a title shot where most guys have to fight four or five people before they get a title shot. It's because he's got so much equity because he's a he's a guy that sells tickets. Yeah. I mean, his big the biggest fights in the UFC, he's been part of like five of them. You know, so he's put himself in position to make those calls and make those decisions for UFC, and Tiger's the same way. Yeah, it's an amazing story. It's going to get a ton of coverage, and I think uh, CBS is going to do monster ratings on their Masters coverage when we hit the weekend, especially if Tiger is in contention. Major League Baseball season is underway. I felt sorry. My son had tickets to the game at Wrigley Field today in the 40-degree weather. I said, you better bundle up. But they got the game in. The Cubs won. They beat Milwaukee 5-4. to four. So they might as well cancel the season. They're 1-0. Yeah. Oh. They want to know. <laughs> first place. Stop it right now. <laughs> first place. <laughs> In first place, baby. Let's wrap it up right now. And there was a story earlier this week. Steven Nelson, who works for Major League Baseball Network, told us uh, about your buddy Carlos Correa was close to signing with the Cubs, but when he changed representation, they said they never gave him the offer. Reportedly, the Cubs offered seven years at over $30 million a season, so that takes it over $210 million. And according to this report, Carlos never was presented the offer because he was in the process of changing agents. He could have been here. So, so it was the agent's fault. Yeah, he was, he was 
uh, firing his old representation. So the, so the, it was like a bitter herb. He was upset that he was not going to be part of this big contract. And he, he brought in, he signed out with Scott Boris, who's yes. like, you know, like David Falk used to be, yep, the, yep. The, the biggest, most powerful agent. Show me the money. Baseball. And so <laughs> Carlos instead signs, uh, you know, a short-term deal with the Minnesota Twins. So the speculation is he may opt out after this year and revisit that offer from the Cubs. Why wouldn't you? I mean, if yeah. you, if you, that's kind of lousy that the agent would do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, come on, man. I mean, like, this is this guy's career. You know, because he doesn't want to work with you for whatever reason, you know, maybe he felt like this agent wasn't going to be able to maximize his earning potential. And that's why he went with Boris. You know, because yeah. Boris has that reputation. He'll get the I money mean, for him. Yeah, was it Corey <laughs> Seager that got the 300 and something? I mean, look at yeah. all the guys he represents. I mean, these guys make big money. So, um, that's, that's it sucks for the Cubs because, yeah. you know, he would have been a really big upgrade you know, from what they have now. I'm not saying what they have now is bad, but, you know, you got a chance to get an all-star and a guy who has a chance to be a Hall of Famer when his career's done. Yeah, imagine if they had gotten Correa to go with, uh, they got the outfielder from Japan, Seiya Suzuki. He got two walks and a hit today, scored a run, so he looks like he's going to be really popular with the bleacher creatures out in right field at Wrigley. So it'll be interesting to see what the Cubs can do. There's kind of a, a, a mismatched roster, you know, some older veterans that are kind of hanging on and some young guys trying to make their mark. A lot more excitement on the south side, but unfortunately, Stacy, a ton of injuries. We got news today. Yohan Mankata is going to miss the first three weeks with an oblique strain. Lance Lynn is out a month and a half. He oh. tweaked his knee pitching in spring training. Garrett Crochet, the left-handed reliever. Tommy they, they, John might, they might have the same voodoo doll man. that the Bulls have. Man. Somebody, somebody's got a voodoo doll of the White Sox. They, 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 they might be the same person. Yeah, that's 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 tough because they're coming into the season as one of the favorites in the American League to get to the World Series. It's a 162 game season. You hope these guys get back. It's not going to make a difference, but you know you always want to get off to a good start in any sport. Yeah, I mean they they've got they've got good quality depth though. You know if they if they can withstand this little early barrage of injuries, you know and and you know maybe get some guys that they weren't counting on to step up and, mm -hmm. and play a bigger role and get that experience. So then when they get later in the season, you know, you got these guys now who played early who you weren't counting on, they're ready to go for you. So that even makes you more deeper. I think the key, though, for them is pitching. You know, if you Michael Kopech's yeah, got to really step up. Yeah, he got. Yeah, it's starter. about time. It's about time yeah. for him to show what he can do. Um, the the opportunity is going to be there for him because they opened up a spot for him to mm -hmm. to shine. So it'll give him a chance to to do what he can do. But pitching is so important to any any good baseball team because they're going to hit. You know, they're they're going to hit. They're going to drive in runs. But that pitching boy, you the pitching can neutralize really really talented hitters. Which has been you know it's been seen for the last few years, especially in the playoffs. And they signed Johnny Cueto to a contract. He's going to get in shape down in the minor leagues, come up probably in a couple of weeks. But I saw some tape of him pitching last year. You're too, well, you guys are a lot younger than me, but you remember Luis Tiant pitching? Yeah, Luis Tiant, yeah. He's doing he's doing the thing like Luis Tiant where he turns his turns back all the way the around and yeah, stops yeah. in the middle of his motion. I'm like, ah, I don't know. No, if you haven't been doing that, you're home. Don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. Because you you know, you you turn too far, that ball's going over the center field, bro. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it, baby. Don't do it. Keep, stay your stuff. Because he used to be a heck of a pitcher. Well, yeah, when he's with the Giants, oh. I remember he pitched against the Cubs in the postseason. They were scared like hell of oh, facing. Oh man, yeah. He was he was dynamic and you know how old is he now? Is he like He's mid thirties? Yeah. Oh man, he he probably lost a little bit on his fastball. Yeah, yeah. but probably, he'll probably be up here in a couple weeks, so we'll see what he's Louis, got. Louis Tian move. Uh, unless he's down in Charlotte and those other hitters are teeing him up, they'll be like, well, maybe maybe he just ought to go off into the sunset. Yeah. You know? How about you know go back to the you know to the Dominican Republic League and work on your work on your uh, delivery a little bit more. But hopefully the, the Sox can uh, overcome these early injuries and and have a big season. Hey, before we get out of here, uh, I know that. Uh, Adam brought this up during the game yesterday about Kansas winning the national championship, and you took you took it like a champ. You know, you, he hit you with a body <laughs> blow, but you kept you kept persevering. Mark, and you just delivered another one. Like you know, it's like you know, we were just gonna get off the show, end the show, and in a positive note, we had Almost you know, we had a, yeah, we I mean, we pulled a Mike Tyson and bit the. Well, we got we got to we got to you know, summarize the uh, NCAA yeah, championship. Yeah, listen, man, you know, I, I they represent the Big Twelve. Okay, yeah. at the end of the day, you said that. In yeah, Twitter. they represent the Big Twelve. Okay. It was hard for me to root for them. You know, it's hard for me to root for Kansas. But, you know, again, they represent the Big 12. Oklahoma's in the Big 12. So I was kind of, 
I wasn't really happy they won because I was really also pulling for Hubert Davis because yeah. and not because I'm a North Carolina fan because I'm not a North Carolina fan because they they revoked my scholarship offer because I didn't want to sign with them as a junior right and I wanted to go on my visits as a senior and they said well we don't know we're gonna have a scholarship offer for you when you you know become a senior and so I've I've always wanted to pay them back but Hubert Davis I'm a big fan of Hubert Davis and you know when they were losing this year you know he was taking a lot of heat from the Tar Heel fans you know ask him for his you know resignation fire him he's not the, the coach for the job and people turned on him you know and to see him battle back he's they should be sending a thank you to the University of Oklahoma I'm gonna throw that out there too because we allowed them to have Brady Manick for yeah, the he year hit some big shots and Brady Manick really got him to the final four I mean, you know, Brady Manick is – we miss him because if we had – if Oklahoma would have had – there's three kids that we had um, that were playing in like the – in the NCAA. Or t- two of them were playing in the Sweet 16. We had a kid from Florida, uh, McNusty or McGusty or something. I forgot his name. but McGusty, he played, yeah. Yeah, he played for Oklahoma. He transferred in the portal. And then we had, you know, we had Brady Manick who went to the Final Four in the National Championship game. So those two players – would have helped Oklahoma this year. Plus, we had another guard, uh, Harmon, that went out to Oregon and played uh, in Oregon, transferred out to Oregon in the portal. So those those guys were three starters on three different teams. So yeah. if we'd have had them, you know, would have, could have, should have. But Porter Moses is going to do a great job down there. We're excited what we're what we're, we're um, you know how we're going to be in the next few years. He's going to get the players that he needs to rebuild our program. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And but Kansas will still be in the conference. Oh Lord! Yeah, every time they were showing those cutaways of Danny Manning in the oh, stands, like, like yeah, I was that was uncalled for. Yeah. Somebody oh, did that on purpose. Yeah, they knew how many I was times did they show him? Like <laughs> they, showed, they showed him about a hundred times, and then they even showed highlights. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't see Kirk they, Heinrich they, out no, there. No, 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 And then they showed highlights of the game. They yeah, kept popping yeah. it in there. And they showed the one play. The one play they 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 didn't want to show my play. I got the steal and went down and dunked the play yeah. before. They want to show the one play where he got the steal and got an and one on me. I say like, okay, all right, yeah. that's low, that's low. Y'all really know how to hurt a guy. Yeah, the one shiny moment. Oh, did you did you, you if you follow me on Twitter, America? Okay, you know I'm I'm active on social media, but Twitter is undefeated. The so, uh, the internet is undefeated. Did you see yeah. the the, the uh, one shiny moment with the <laughs> with Lakers? The Lakers, yeah, I did. Oh yeah. my god! I I mean, dude, I was like, I literally spit out my drink when yeah. I saw it because I didn't know what to expect. And somebody said, "Hey, Stacey, take a look at this." Boom! Yeah, boom. Yeah, this is really hilarious. hilarious. So then I hit it, and, and, and at first I see one shiny moment. I'm like, "Please tell me they're not doing this." So I hit it, and the whole, I mean, the Westbrook whole Lakers, up the whole Lakers season, <laughs> yeah, you know, one shiny moment, yeah, you know, and then, it, and then it, when when he shot the air ball, and then Patrick Beverly held his nose like you know, yeah. it stinks, and <laughs> and then you know Carl Anthony Towns is looking at, you know, he's looking up there. I mean, it was it, whoever whoever made yeah, that video really well should done. get an award. They should give him an Emmy or something because that was amazing. So if you follow me, America. Uh, you know, look at my feed and uh, look at the Lakers' one shiny moment. It's, yeah. And some Laker fan tweeted me and said, it's too soon, Stacey. <laughs> and I, I said, no, it's not. It's not too soon. Because yeah. if the Bulls are losing, you'd be talking about us. So, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, LeBron right. went back and deleted his tweet from the beginning of the year. Keep your enthusiasm. No. Nah. It's and, all, and, and, all the haters. Yeah. And, yeah. and they, you know what, keep that same energy. So, you know, they, they took a huge hit with Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson is really not the best PR guy that you want on the <laughs> on the on the T V circuit talking about your team. Seriously. He's a, he's a little salty about that. Seriously, being I don't know anymore. what it is, you know, because yeah. I it's like he says some of the I mean, listen, I respect Magic. I love Magic. Magic's a good dude. But it's almost like he's not he's not part of the team or the organization. Yeah. And he's saying things that make the Lakers look bad. And, you know, we all know the story. You know, DeMar DeRozan wanted to go to L.A. Right. He wanted to be there. But the only way that can make that happen was a sign and trade deal. Okay, that's the only way that 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 drill that deal could have happened. Um, as far as like you know, uh, Buddy Heel, the shooter. You know, they would have had to trade Kuzma, and Sacramento would have had to agree to that. So there's a lot of things that you know would have had to come into play for those those moves to happen. But to lose Alex Caruso, and Alex Caruso even came here and said, it, and he said it on yeah. you know media, he would have taken less money. You know, he wanted to go back to L.A. And when he got the offer from the Bulls. He went back there to them to either match it. And he even said, basically said, I'll take less money than what the Bulls are going to give me. No, that's right. You better take that. So they didn't want him. Yeah. And and now, 
you see everybody talking about how important those guys were, the glue guys, the the role players. So you go out there and get all these Hall of Famer guys who are going to be Hall of Fame that are past their prime. You know, you you didn't need to be a rocket scientist to realize that uh, Russell Westbrook was not going to fit into that system. He wasn't because he's not a shooter. He's a guy that he, he needs the ball in his hands. With LeBron having the ball in his hands, it's almost impossible for him to function. OK, and, you know, a lot of these guys, they couldn't make shots. They can't defend. And so that's been their biggest problem. And then Anthony Davis, when was the last time AD played 82 games? Long he, hasn't, time. Yeah. he hasn't played 82 games this whole season. Half you know, you're man, talking half season. Yeah, they were. I mean, you know, the jokes and all that stuff is, you know, the they call them suits or, you know, Charles street, Bart, clothes. street clothes or whatever <laughs> they call them. You know, it's 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 funny. and You get a laugh out of it, but it's real. And he's, he's a top five player in this league. And when your top five player is constantly missing 40 and 50 games a year, I just saw yesterday where Adam Silver is talking about players missing games, you know, and, and they got to talk about this. They got to do something about it. Man, they're not, there's too many guys missing too many games, and it's not fair to the fans. It's not fair to the fans that come out. Now, if you're legitimately hurt, that's one thing. But if you're sitting out for, you know, rest management and all this other stuff, that's not fair to the fans. If I'm if I only see you one time and I'm paying eight hundred dollars for my wife and kids to go see yeah. you play and I see you over there, you know, walking around with the bling on and sunglasses on and, you know, you're sitting on the bench, I didn't come here to see that. I came to see you play basketball. And I was telling uh Tamara Anderson who does a lot of our stuff. Yeah, and happy birthday to Tamara by the way. Happy birthday Tamara Anderson. Their nickname is Brown Sugar. <laughs> yes, that's a nickname. But she works behind the scenes with with me and Adam and she does a lot of research things and you know, we're doing something uh so I had her look up some some uh, information about you know, when the Bulls were winning the championship, you know, how many games guys miss. And you go down, you go back and look at Michael Jordan's numbers through those years of the championship years. Michael Jordan was playing 80 plus I games know. in the regular mm-hmm. season. In the regular season, there's only 82 in the regular season. And we're not talking about the playoffs because he didn't miss any games, playoff. But we're talking about regular season yeah. games. Michael Jordan didn't miss games, he played. And I think people forget that back in those days, Mark, that was a pride thing. Mm-hmm. You know, guys wanted to get 82 games in. You know, we wanted to play 82 games. And those Bulls championship teams, you know, the reason why we won, yeah, we were better than everybody else, but we didn't miss games. Yeah. We showed up to play every single night, Our the whole team. Nobody missed games, and it was a prideful thing. We had the least amount of games missed during those championship runs. Stacy didn't miss games, and he never misses an episode of Give Me the Hot Sauce. No, Every week, coming at you, a brand new episode on YouTube. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe, as my buddy Pavel always says. So we want to thank our guest, Chris D. Lofton, for joining the show. We'll be coming at you next week with a playoff preview, the NBA postseason ready to go. Episode 73 of Give Me the Hot Sauce is in the books. And get your new hot sauce, baby. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Chicago Fire 1871. You want it hot? We brought you the hottest hot sauce you'll ever taste. And it tastes good. And remember, she'll like it, too. Go to GiveMeTheHotSauce.com to yes. place your order. And before we leave, drive home safely, Chicago. Beep, beep. Derek Bowen.